I'll be presenting surface flow intermittency results in ecological traps for a fish assembly. Uh, this is a little bit of my background info. I've been working with, for the New Mexico Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office since 2007. Uh, I've worked primarily with Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, uh, and that would be the augmentation and, and fish rescue. A little background on this project. Uh, this work was done with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in June and July of 2020. We collected a lot of data. Uh, the overarching aim was to try to look at the effects of not pumping at the south boundary of Bosque del Apache, how that might affect fish and fish habitat, so, uh, specifically Rio Grande Silvery Minnow. So this presentation just covers changes in meso habitat and fish catch rates as we uh, performed a flow reduction. So drying and drought are major disturbance for stream fishes. Uh, and with water use increasing and climate change decreasing the amount of precipitation, the frequency and duration of intermittency are expected to increase. So fish have a couple refuge strategies they might try to use. Uh, first, they might try to move the refuge areas prior to the disturbance occurring, or they might be trapped within them at the onset of intermittency, which is to say they just happen to be in the right place at the right time when intermittency set in. So they may have a behavioral strategy where they, where they actually migrate out of these areas. They may have some physiological strategy where they estivate or they have a tolerance to harsh conditions, or they may have a life history strategy where some of these opportunistic species have high demographic resilience and they can withstand uh, major losses to their population. Other species might have a life history strategy that includes eggs that persist through the dry season and do not hatch until the wet season. So some of the questions that we asked are what are refuges for fish in the middle of Rio Grande during drying? And specific to this presentation, how are fish using them? How are fish arriving at these refuge areas? Are they there just by happenstance or are they actually moving to them? And why are these questions important? Uh, we want to be able to predict the consequences of decreasing surface flows. And these are often context dependent. Depends on the system, it depends on the species. So trying to understand how drying affects fish and how fish use refuges will help us determine appropriate conservation actions for that species and for that system. So we had a couple of, of hypotheses. Uh, either fish move to refuge uh, and we'll, we would observe a spatial change in fish density as we see fish moving away from areas prone to drying and into areas of refuge where there would be perennial surface flow. Or the fish are trapped in the proximal habitats and we're not going to see any spatial changes in fish density. Here's a conceptual diagram of, of what I'm trying to explain. So on the left you have fish distributed throughout the river while their surface flow is present. And on the right, you can see them moving to refuge in the upstream areas with a couple of people, a couple of fish that didn't quite get the message. This is opposed to trapped within the proximal habitats where you, on the left again, you have the fish distributed throughout the river. And on the right, they end up in the isolated pools instead of moving up to areas of perennial flow. This is important in the middle of Rio Grande because these pools don't persist for more than three to five days. So the fish that are trapped in isolated pools are almost certainly going to die. We used a before-after quasi-experimental design uh, where we controlled flow uh, each week. We didn't have a spatial control, but we do have multiple pre-impact samples to serve as temporal controls. We also have sampling immediately before and after multiple impacts, and we have a known controlled impact. So although it's not a perfect design, this still gives you a pretty robust design for making inferences. So we selected 10 random locations between the low flow conveyance channel and the south boundary pumping station. Those are the yellow diamonds. Uh, we did fish and habitat surveys from June 16th to July 16th, 2020. 
And the red and blue areas are where we observed drying in 2018. So you can kind of get an idea of how much of that reach dried when the pumps were completely off. So for the flow reduction, there's three pumps located at the upstream ends at the south boundary of Bosque del Apache. Altogether, those three pumps can put out just about 35 CFS. So we performed two fish surveys and one habitat survey prior to any flow reduction. So with all three pumps running, we surveyed the fish once two weeks before and once one week before, and we also did one habitat survey one week before. Then we just started doing some of these pumping reductions and we repeated the process. So we'd have a pump that was shut off on Sunday, we'd go out and do the fish and habitat surveys that week. Uh, no drying actually occurred until the last pump went off. Uh, so for that last one, the pump went off on uh, Monday. We did fish rescue on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we did the last of the surveys on uh, Thursday and Friday of that week. And uh, we ended up with 40 total surveys for habitat and 50 surveys for fish. So the methods for habitat, uh, we have a discharge for each sample and we installed uh, temperature loggers. Um, I'm just barely going to get into that in this presentation, but the data is available. Uh, for habitat, we had 10 transects at each site, 11 points along the transects. So we collected 110 points per site per survey. And at each point, we collected a depth, velocity, and categorical mesohabitat. So in all, there's 4,400 measurements. Now we use those measurements to estimate the surface area of each type of mesohabitat and the depth and velocity of each mesohabitat. For the fish, we performed 15 to 20 hauls each week, uh, 799 total hauls. Again, two pre-impact surveys. Equals total fish. So if we caught 100 fish at the site and we sampled half the site, there would be 200 total fish. So in the future, uh, I'm gonna work on trying to model the meso habitat specific CPUE and multiply that by the mesohabitat availability to get total fish. I was not able to complete that for this presentation. Uh, so results on the discharge. Again, I don't have a whole lot of time to spend on this. Uh, no drying actually occurred until all the pumps were off, although it was very close to drying at sites four and five. Uh, with no pumps running, two sites did maintain surface flow. Four sites had isolated pools and four sites dried completely. Uh, for temperature, the take home from this is the low flow on the top row is much cooler and has a lot less variability than any of the sites in the, in the river. Uh, site number 10 is only two miles downstream from the pump channel and it regularly exceeds 30 degrees. And some of the sites regularly exceed 35 degrees. The most striking result from the habitat survey, as you, you'll notice, is the immediate loss of run habitat with each pumping reduction. Uh, the pool habitat initially increases as the run habitat is converted to pool habitat, but by the end, all the habitats decrease. So while the run habitat is maybe not the most important or preferred habitat for silvery meadow or other species, it's important because it does provide connectivity among the habitats. So with the loss of that run habitat, uh, the, the longitudinal and lateral connectivity is reduced. So in, what you're looking at here is the shallowest transect per site. Uh, so for the first two surveys, it's still about 15 centimeters or deeper, uh, but with the, only a single pump or no pumps running, it's reduced to less than 10 centimeters. Just for reference, 10 centimeters is about three, uh, four inches. Uh, so that's, that's really, if fish are moving around in the site, that's really going to be a physical deterrent, especially to the large fish, uh, but maybe even to the small fish. So on the bottom, that's just kind of the average channel profile from, from all of our surveys. You can see there's not much of a change from three pumps to two pumps. And it gets significantly um, narrower with only a single pump. And the depths are almost entirely below 10 centimeters. And then with no pumps running, you can see that the, there's a very large reduction in both lateral connectivity and longitudinal connectivity. And that's because most of the sites were just reduced to isolated pools. So this is just kind of summing up the surface areas of all the mesohabitats. 
So the very top one is just the total surface area. And you can see that it slightly decreases until you get to the last hump, and then there's a major decrease in total area. That's driven largely by run area, which you can see decreases with every pumping production. Uh, the pool area initially increases and then decreases. And the backwater and isolated pool areas are just kind of all over the place as they're gained from run areas and lost uh, just due to flow reductions. But the overarching theme here is that on the final pumping production, when there are no pumps running, all the habitats become pretty rare. Uh, results of the fish surveys. So we had 46 surveys. There were, there were four sites with no surface water remaining and no fish. We collected 15 species and almost 33,000 individuals. Uh, however, 32,000 of those individuals were either red shiners or western mosquito fish. And there were only 39 silvery minnow. And 18 of those came in a single sample. So I, I'm mentioning that because it causes some problems with the estimates of numbers of fish. So you can see some of the outliers on the right side. Uh, the total fish in the top row is driven largely by the red shiners, as there were just thousands and thousands of them. <clears throat> but the single St. Hall of 18 silvery minnows is the green dot on the right in the second row. So you can see that CPUE is pretty low, the estimated number of fish is pretty low throughout, except for that one observation. So overall, you see there's some extreme high outliers, but if you're trying to look for a pattern, there's not an obvious decreasing, there's not an obvious pattern of decreasing densities at some sites and increasing densities at other sites. So there's no real evidence that the fish are moving out of sites and moving into other ones. Uh, we also note that almost all the fish, when the final pump was shut off, all the fish had much lower numbers, uh, just because there's so much less habitat available, except for western mosquito fish, which seem to be doing just fine and actually increase. So another way to look at this is through the diesel habitat specific CPUE. So you're looking at the surveys with three, two, one, or zero pumps uh, with each different type of meso habitat. And they all kind of increase as the pumping rate goes down. That's probably due to just concentration of the fish. There's less, there's a, there's a similar amount of fish in the less area, so your CPUE gives up. However, what I want to draw your attention to is that the isolated pools and the pools prior to isolation have similar CPUEs. This is not what you'd expect if fish were moving out. This is what you would expect if fish are actually staying in the same areas and getting trapped within isolated pools. So what we observed was uh, decreasing lateral and longitudinal connectivity. Uh, we didn't find any evidence of long movements to escape drying. Uh, but we did find evidence that the fish were making these small scale movements to refuge, which then become isolated and die. The isolated pools had tens of thousands of fish in them. And initially, these would offer higher survival than the surrounding landscape. The, the deepest part is much better than the shallowest part. This is almost the definition of an ecological trap, where the fish are choosing these places, they're lured into these places that initially seem to increase their survival, but then end up lowering their survival. So why are the fish doing this? Well, there's not really any cues for them to move other than decreasing flow. The water quality is pretty similar. Although temperature fluctuates throughout the day, there's nothing for them, there's no cue for them to really know that they need to move out of there. And with the low turbidity, uh, they're likely just seeking cover, cover in the deepest parts of the river. So there's a behavioral and physical deterrent to move through the shallow water. And this is just a question in general, but the water this hot, I'm not sure how that would affect their bioenergetics and the fish may not even want to move. So how are fish persisting through stream flow intermittency? Uh, historically, many of these species are abundant, widespread, and have an opportunistic life history, which is they're small, short-lived, fecund, mature early, agile, and they have a high demographic resilience. 
that let them already occur in the refuge areas and quickly repopulate once the disturbance is passed. So this is not effective when there's only a few fish, those species that no longer have high demographic resilience. So a good comparison is to the red shiner to silvery minnow. At the end of the study, red shiners still had about 30,000 fish that occurred in the two wetted areas that would be able to recolonize the rest of the reefs uh, versus silvery minnow, which we only saw 39 of during the entire survey. So really the question is, how do we improve silvery minnow demographic resilience? If you can do that, then they may be able to persist through some of these longer drought periods. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.